Hello and uh, good evening or good afternoon or good morning if you are on the other side of the world. Um, and welcome to uh, our webinar uh, today. Um, Oh, the webinar is um, is called uh, Autonomous Island Regions, Indigenous Peoples and Self-Determination, Insights from Greenland and New Caledonia. Um, and um, this is um, part of um, a webinar series on world autonomies, uh, which is organized jointly by um, the teams of the uh, Institute for Minority Rights, Institute for Comparative Federalism, and the Autonomy Center of uh, uh, Iraq Research in uh, Bolzano, Bozen, South Tyrol, Italy. Uh, this is also part of a project that uh, we run together with uh, several other partners in Europe, uh, a project called Autonomous Arrangements in the World, um, if you are not aware about this project, I would uh, like to invite you to, to uh, visit the website of the project, which is www.world-autonomies.info. Uh, I think it's a very interesting project because um, it is an online compendium of uh, case studies of autonomy arrangements, both territorial and non-territorial autonomy arrangements. Uh, and what I think is also very important to mention is the fact that the aim of this project also is to study, to examine, and to discuss, as we are doing today, um, cases that less are less known, uh, especially in Europe. And um, I'm really glad that today we'll discuss about Greenland and um, New Caledonia because I think it goes without saying that these are two cases that probably uh, uh, very few, uh, even among experts on autonomy arrangements, are um, uh, having a, a very deep knowledge uh, on them. And we selected them for various reasons. First of all, because they are both island autonomies. They both have uh, indigenous population and they both, as I said from the title, have this um, very peculiar uh, position when it comes to the uh, discussion discussions around uh, uh, self determination. Um, without uh, further uh, delays, I would like to introduce you our two speakers today. Uh, first, uh, uh, Maria Akren, uh, who is an associate professor in political science at the uh, University of Greenland. Um, she has worked since 2001, um, but also has taught and researched at the ABO Academy in Finland and um, has been also a guest lecturer at the Mid Sweden University in, in Ostersund in Sweden. Um, she's also an affiliated researcher with uh, several institutions, among them uh, being Oran Peace Institute, the Institute for International Affairs and its research centers, the Center for Small State Studies, and the Center for Arctic Policy Studies at the University of Iceland. In fact, um, her uh, research profile is focused very much on autonomous areas in the world, with a special focus on the Nordic autonomous regions. And um, uh, she also studies uh, uh, regional parties and uh, is also interested and in researches qualitative methods. Um, her research is typically in the area between comparative and international comparative law and international politics. Um, then we'll have uh, my dear colleague from the Institute for Comparative Federalism at the Iraq Research, Elizabeth Alber, who is also the, uh, the group leader of the research group Participation and Innovations at the Institute for Comparative Federalism. And uh, she's also the, um, the leader of the, as always managing the program uh, Iraq Research Federal Scholar at uh, the Institute for Comparative Federalism. Um, she's um, uh, lecturing at the University of Innsbruck on law and policy making in federal system federal system systems and uh, she also holds uh, external associate uh, positions at uh, various um, research centers uh, such as the Center for Deliberative Democracy and Global Governance at the University of Canberra and the Center for Multilevel Federalism uh, of the Institute of Social Sciences in New Delhi. Um, she is also the, um, as she was the co-convener of the research group, uh, uh, Constitutionalism and Societal Pluralism of the International Association of Constitutional Law. Uh, and in this position, she also coordinated uh, a blog symposium on constitutionalism and pluralism in overseas France. 
my name is uh, Sergio Constantin. I'm a senior researcher at the Institute for uh, Minority Rights of, the, of Eurac Research, and I will uh, moderate the discussion today. Um, I would uh, suggest to uh, to start by uh, giving the two speakers um, time to to offer us a kind of uh, introduction on the two case studies. Uh, and then I suggest to, to, to have a, a general discussion and I encourage the, the audience to, to write uh, uh, the questions in uh, using the Q&A uh, section, because as you might notice, the, the chat uh, option is, is not functioning for the, the audience. So uh, please uh, keep this in mind. And uh, uh, if you want to, to ask any questions to the, to the two speakers, uh, please use the Q&A. Therefore, now I think we can start, and uh, I would give uh, Maria the first uh, first time the floor. So, Maria, please tell us uh, uh, more about Greenland. Thank you. I will uh, uh, will share the screen. Yes. So Yeah, well, thank you, Sergio, for, for the nice introduction. Um, so I'm uh, here at Ilisima Tesafik, the University of Greenland, and this is the picture of, of the university here in the, in the background. Um, I will start a little bit uh, around the historical background uh, for the self-government of, of Greenland. So as uh, most of you know probably is that there is a, a, a long colonial background uh, of uh, of Greenland and Hans Egede, uh, which was a, a Norwegian Danish missionary coming uh, to the island, and this is the statue uh, of him standing in in the colony harbor. Um, and. Uh, uh, it started in 1721 uh, and uh, ended in 1953. And during the colonial time, uh, every major decision was uh, made in Copenhagen. Uh, there was also uh, a kind of a, a trade uh, uh, which was only between uh, Denmark and, and Greenland going on through what was called the, the Royal Greenlandic Trade. Uh, KGH uh, at that time. So Greenland was quite isolated from the rest of the world uh, during, uh, during the, the colonial time. Uh, during the Second World War, uh, when uh, Denmark became occupied by Nazi Germany, uh, uh, Greenland became under the protection of uh, America, uh, North America, and uh, and this uh, changed the society a lot since uh, it was the first time uh, Greenland was opened up for uh, for trade with with other countries, uh, and uh, the Americans were establishing a lot of different military bases uh, along the coast. Um, and several of these uh, American bases uh, are now uh, civilian airports or harbors uh, uh, nowadays. Uh, the only uh, uh, thing, uh, the only uh, base still operating is the Peter Fick, the two layer base up in the north of, of Greenland, where, where there is now a, a kind of a radar station. There has been a, an exercise quite recently uh, also with the uh, fighters from, uh, from US uh, uh, due to uh, there are some occasional exercises going on uh, also in the Arctic. Uh, during the county period uh, when uh, Greenland became integrated into uh, the Kingdom of Denmark in, from 1953 and onwards to 1978, uh, this was actually a kind of a tactic from Danish side, uh, since this was a part of, of the kind of uh, decolonization process also within the UN framework. Uh, but Greenland was never given uh, the options uh, that other autonomies were given at that time. Uh, there was options of uh, being independent 
or uh, given self-government or then becoming an integrated part of, uh, of the metropolitan state. And uh, uh, the Danish uh, uh, officials at that time uh, 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 seemed that Greenland then should become an integrated part of, uh, of Denmark. Uh, and they become that. And as well, in, in the beginning of the 70s, when Denmark then was going into uh, the European Economic Community for membership, there was two referendums one in, in Greenland and one in, in Denmark at the same time. And, and the referendum on the, on the 2nd of October 1972 uh, actually gave a majority uh, against uh, the EEC membership in Greenland. But since Greenland only was a county, uh, uh, Greenland be, we also became a member uh, uh, together with Denmark at, at that time. Yeah, that was already said that it was an integrated uh, part of, of Denmark. And uh, we see uh, in the 1960s and 70s, uh, we see the kind of first kind of critical movements, uh, political movements starting up, uh, uh, which were kind of against the, the colonial rule of, uh, of the society. So the first political parties are established uh, during that time. It was actually one party in uh, in Inuit party uh, amongst educated Greenlanders in Copenhagen who actually started the process uh, with, with these political movements. And later on, it became more of grassroots movements also uh, throughout Greenland. Uh, and uh, uh, we see uh, established parties in the late of the 1970s coming into the picture. Uh, so before the Self-Government Act then was implemented in 1979, there had been some uh, seminars and workshops uh, amongst these uh, newly established political parties. Um, and uh, there was also a, a Greenlandic commission established uh, with the uh, representatives from Greenland and, and Denmark in order to, uh, to write uh, the Self-Government Act uh, for, for Greenland. And then there was a referendum in 1978 where a majority of the population, about 75%, voted for uh, a home rule. Uh, and uh, since the establishment was then in place for, for the home rule with an own parliament and an own uh, government, uh, there was also time to, to question if Greenland uh, should be, be part of the EEC. And uh, uh, therefore, there was new, a new referendum taking place in 1982 uh, about the, the membership. And this time, uh, uh, the Greenlanders then withdraw from uh, the EEC and became an OCT, the Overseas Countries and Territories instead. There are some special uh, bilateral treaties, uh, like a fishery treaty and a partnership treaty uh, between Greenland and the EU, uh, uh, as, uh, which is still valid today. This was also read, mentioned. It took, it took three years of negotiations uh, to leave uh, the EEC. And this is, we can also see now with the Brexit that it takes a lot of time before you have uh, uh, the full negotiations in place by uh, leaving uh, such a, a union. Uh, Greenland has over the years taken over more and more matters. Uh, uh, from uh, uh, the Danish uh, uh, side, um, there are uh, kind of different matters depending on um, uh, the competences. And uh, with the, the Self-Government Act, the home rule system, uh, there were a list of, of a lot of issues like uh, education, healthcare, uh, infrastructure, uh, transportation and other things which were uh, quite easily transferred to, to Greenlandic uh, authorities. 
And uh, during the 2000s and onwards, there has been a lot of um, international interest in, in Greenlandic natural resources. And uh, since Greenland they have a lot of assets uh, along the coasts of, of different different minerals like rare earth elements, uh, uranium and uh, diamonds, uh, copper and so on, zinc and, and what else. Uh, and since there has been this uh, attention from uh, abroad from, from different superpowers and so on, there was also a necessity to, to build up a more uh, foreign policy uh, apparatus in, in a sense. And with this full from 2005, uh, Greenland receives uh, more influence in international relations. Here, Greenland is uh, supposed to be uh, participating in negotiations when there are international relations that uh, are really uh, important for, for Greenland. Uh, and Greenland also has more to say on, uh, for instance, the two layer base and other other issues, which are uh, usually matters which are underneath uh, the, the, the Kingdom of Denmark. Uh, and in 2009, uh, we see an extended version of the Self-Government Act uh, coming into place, uh, where uh, these international uh, relations is also mentioned in, in, in the Act nowadays. Uh, and also with the 2009 uh, Self-Government Act, all natural resources uh, are also transferred to, to Greenland. Before that, it was a kind of a divided joint uh, mechanism between uh, Denmark and, and Greenland. Uh, but now uh, everything is underneath uh, uh, the Greenlandic authorities. Uh, uh, another issue is, of course, that Greenland still is uh, dependent economically on Denmark. There is this block grant, uh, which is now uh, frozen uh, at the 2009-11 with, uh, level with, with some adjustments regarding uh, inflation and taxes and, and so on. It's 3.4 billion uh, Danish krones, uh, which is then covering uh, the self-government uh, uh, as a whole. So it's qu quite a big portion of the GDP of, of Greenland. If you look at the form of self-government, we can say that this is a, a typical delegation model, meaning that uh, uh, there are, there, Greenland is not entrenched in, in the constitution, uh, in the Danish constitution. But there is this self-government act regulating uh, uh, the matters and competences between uh, Denmark and Greenland. And uh, uh, there are these kind of lists uh, where you have uh, lists which, which matters can be directly transferred to Greenland if the Greenlandic authorities uh, would like to do that. And then there is a list where, where some matters still needs negotiations. Uh, for uh, further transferring these issues. Uh, there is a, a mentioning in the Danish constitution regarding elections to the Danish parliament. So both Greenland and Faroe Islands have two members each uh, in, in the Danish uh, uh, parliament. And usually it's the, the largest parties uh, who represent uh, then uh, uh, Greenland in this, we have one from Simwit party and one from uh, Inuit Atakatigit at the moment. Uh, there has been some uh, uh, different interpretations of how this self-government should, should be seen, uh, and but most uh, lawyers and, uh, and political scientists at least see it as an agreement, as a kind of uh, uh, agreement which cannot be, be withdrawn, even though it's a normal act, uh, it could be withdrawn if in legal terms, if, if Denmark would like to do that. But it, it's, it would be really hard to do it nowadays since, since this relationship is 
uh, is so embedded in in uh, in the the minds of of people and and uh, and authorities and officials and so on. Yeah. So as already said, there are these different uh, competencies which are uh, regulated according to if they are totally Greenlandic matters. There are some joint matters still uh, within, uh, especially uh, uh, the police and uh, some of the health sector uh, uh, and and so on, which are divided between Greenland and Denmark. And then, of course, uh, Denmark still has uh, uh, the kind of overall sovereignty when it comes to uh, immigration policy, currency, uh, foreign security policy. Uh, uh, and so on. But we have own institutions in form of the parliament in Nazi Statut and Nalakarche Sosut, which is the government, and there are also some courts on the lower level uh, which take care of, uh, of uh, uh, some matters. But then uh, the, the Supreme Court is then in, in Copenhagen. Uh, this is just to show you uh, some of the results uh, throughout the years uh, regarding uh, the different parties. Um, <clears throat> I'm not going <laughs> to uh, talk so much about it. It's just to, to see the trends that uh, the, the original parties like Siumut, Atasut, Inuit, Atakatigit, uh, and then from 2002, we have a new party, Democratic, uh, and also Nalarak uh, are the kind of major parties at the moment, uh, and uh, that these uh, classical parties, traditional parties, are still kind of uh, those that are dominating uh, the political scene in, in Greenland. Uh, and if you look at the positions, we can say there are two kind of dimensions uh, when it comes to how the political parties uh, are uh, divided. So we have the sovereignty association or unionism uh, at one uh, as one dimension, and then left right uh, as the other dimension. And uh, most of the political parties are actually in favor of independence. Uh, there are only uh, few uh, Atasut and Samarbetsparti, which are kind of unionist parties, uh, and but the rest are are more in favor of uh, of independence. And as you can also see, uh, uh, some of the parties are more on the left side uh, of politics than on the right side hand of of politics here. There has been a uh, different opinion service uh, done uh, around independence. Independence is usually uh, one of the major issues uh, coming up uh, in the election campaigns. And from 2017, the, there was a, a, a new based uh, opinion survey who has analyzed, uh, which was doing an, a kind of a survey amongst the population. And then 44% of the population was uh, uh, in favor of independence without any changes of, of welfare. And uh, we can see that also 27% uh, uh, was uh, for a developed self-government. Uh, so there was really a clear majority for more uh, increased uh, independence uh, at that time. Uh, there are two researchers, Gustav Agnemann and Kelta Minor, who, who made a survey uh, a year later. They had a little bit of different questions in that survey, so it's not really comparable. Uh, and also the sample uh, of the population was a little bit different. Uh, but here we also see that there was 38% uh, uh, that was uh, for independence. Uh, and 42% was uh, more against independence. So here we see a more kind of division between uh, the, the population, a kind of uh, yeah, equal result in a sense. Uh, and then there has also been some uh, uh, 
opinion polls uh, done in Denmark, uh, 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 Epinion, which is a, a Danish uh, opinion survey uh, uh, company, uh, has asked the people in Denmark what they, they think uh, about uh, Greenlandic independence. Uh, at, and here we see that 37% wishes that this kingdom of Denmark, the Riksfelleskapet, uh, should sustain, but, but they are also in favor of uh, that Faroe Islands and Greenland could receive more in the uh, self-government, for instance. And 18% uh, uh, means that Faroe Island and, and Greenland might become independent states uh, uh, and so on. So this is just a very short, brief introduction. Uh, uh, I hope there will be more questions uh, uh, that I can answer uh, during uh, the seminar. Uh, yes, thank you, Maria, very, very much for this uh, very, very interesting uh, uh, presentation. I think uh, I already have three or four questions in mind. And uh, I will keep them for, for the second part of the webinar. And now without you, uh, without any delay, I would give the floor to Elizabeth um, to uh, hear more about uh, New Caledonia. Thank you very much, Sergio. And I immediately uh, jump into a uh, far away, but still somehow connected <laughs> example. So the first question obviously would be, okay, why uh, do uh, why are we interested in, um, in the autonomy issue when we talk about New Caledonia, knowing that it is actually part of uh, France and knowing that France has actually a very like unitary system, uh, at least um, as it is known in uh, continental European uh, terms. Um, New Caledonia is, as said, um, a very far uh, part uh, in basically the Pacific. I have here brought basically the map of uh, what is called uh, the overseas France, so overseas territories of uh, France, and you can see that actually uh, France has uh, many overseas territories all around um, the different world regions, and uh, most of them are actually islands, which has obviously also a key uh, importance with regard to the economic power of also France has, if we take it from an international law point of view, and if we remind ourselves about the exclusive economic zone when it comes to maritime law and so on and so forth. Uh, what you see on this map is basically all the overseas territories of um, France. Uh, you might have noticed uh, that they have different colors, <laughs> and the different colors uh, refer actually to the different legal statuses they have. So, um, although um, each of them has done very specific bilateral arrangements, and here we are in the autonomy issue, um, uh, we can broadly say that basically the, uh, the département et région d'outre-mer, so the ones you see in pink, basically um, they're the principle of um, of. Uh, the principle applies that basically um, you have uh, the laws applying from uh, from France directly applying also to these overseas territories um, with some extra subsidies and so on and so forth. Then you have the categories of uh, the collectivities, collectivité d'outre-mer, which has a known status again and have uh, some um, further, let's say, autonomy and special autonomy also statuses. And then you have the extra category of uh, New Caledonia, uh, Nouvelle Caledonie. And it is an extra, um, let's say, category within the categorization of um, overseas France. Next also to the territories uh, um, you see basically in orange here on the map, which are the territories which are the, the not really inhabited and where also international law um, applies. So um, um, 
this uh, basically put down this into into legal terms um we have the category of the the so called drum so the departement and uh, region d'outre-mer then we have collectivities and we have new caledonia these are basically the three categories uh, when it comes to um competences, uh, you have uh, a varying degree of um, um, adaptation of uh, special laws that apply, but are still basically brought forward by uh, the politics and uh, adopted uh, by the French continental um, um, institutions. And you have, on the other hand, then um, um, the situation of New Caledonia that has a, uh, a statute, a uh, autonomy law that has uh, very clearly uh, listed the powers uh, that belong to uh, the uh, um, to New Caledonia as an entity and also has enshrined the so-called principle of irreversibility of powers. So powers that are already com conferred, already uh, transferred to New Caledonia cannot anymore be actually taken back by Paris, to put it in simple terms. Obviously, you have many uh, different formats of intergovernmental relations, and you have also uh, many complex arrangements when it comes to finances. Um, so in short, if we look to New Caledonia, which is geographically located in the Pacific, we can say that New Caledonia has relations to uh, basically the Paris, then it has relations to the European Union, and then it has also relations, obviously, uh, to the UN, because of the fact that it is um, part um, of um, the UN uh, list of non-self-governing territories. And it has um, also many relations in the immediate uh, neighborhood. Um, as said, uh, New Caledonia is um, on the list of non-self-governing territories, and uh, it is closely, obviously, monitored also from uh, various international organizations with regard to uh, the so-called decolonization process, which is linked to uh, the road, the difficult road towards autonomy New Caledonia had, and New Caledonia um, is currently, um, uh, it was in the last uh, years and still is negotiating about. I will explain it uh, in a minute. So what is what are basic facts of New Caledonia, of this uh, group of islands, let's say, um, just a couple of hours flight from Sydney. Um, it's a population of uh, less than 300,000. Um, it has a huge econ uh, exclusive economic zone, so you have obviously the interest also uh, from France actually to uh, to be present in uh, that part of the world. It has uh, a, a demography which is composed of um, uh, summarizing, putting it simply, uh, of uh, more or less 30% so-called Europeans or uh, persons that um, affiliate, let's say, to European descendants, and uh, about 40% uh, Kanak population, and that would be the autochthonous population that has always lived there. And um, obviously, I do not have the time now to go too much <laughs> back into history, but um, you can imagine that obviously uh, it, it has been uh, part of uh, the politics of a penal colony and so on and so forth. So today, uh, basically, you have a population that is uh, could be called in political uh, science terminology, a divided society. Um, and you can see it obviously also when you look at maps here, uh, I brought one uh, with regard to where the different, uh, let's say, um, 
yeah, where the different uh, peoples live, um, you see that the uh, Kanak population is rather concentrated on some parts and uh, so-called European um, uh, population or descendants of uh, Europeans living there, also second generations, live uh, rather concentrated uh, in other parts. The road to autonomy has been very uh, difficult and it has been a road um, full of also civil unrest. And it has been uh, basically uh, grounded on uh, bilateral um, agreements between uh, a signatory committee composed of um, Kanak uh, persons and representatives from the so-called Europeans from the New Caledonian side, and obviously from the French side, from the continental metropolitan French side, uh, um, representatives from uh, the uh, basically the Ministry for Affairs for um, Overseas France uh, from Paris. And um, there have been basically two agreements and the important thing is that uh, the first agreement in 1988 uh, was put into place basically also to uh, stop the civil unrest, to um, come up with a plan to redistribute land and mining resources, because New Caledonia is actually the place where 25% of all the nickel worldwide is so you can imagine the importance it it has uh, with regard to um, um, social and also economic inequalities within the population. Then back in the late eighties, the, uh, there was also a, an agency created for basically the development of the autochthonous population, the Kanak population, and there was already back then inbuilt in these agreements a promise. Um, to uh, organize an independence vote. And uh, there were several um, several um, like administrative reforms, basically creating three provinces and introducing uh, basically uh, yeah, elections uh, and uh, representation mechanisms, which have not been in place beforehand. Then uh, both sides, let's say, uh, uh, New Caledonia, the complexity within the New Caledonian society as one side and also the, uh, the side of, the, of France, of Paris and, and New Caledonia, basically the loyalists and those fighting for independence actually uh, reached an agreement that they would um, extend uh, the time frame where to uh, go for the referendum. And so they extended the time frame, and uh, they agreed in uh, 1998 to do the referendum um, by uh, 2018, the first one. And why am I saying the first one? Because these um, agreements have built in the mechanism to have um, up to three referendums of independence in a row. Um, with maximum distance from one to another referendum of two years. If the first one was a, a no vote and so on. So the, this is the, uh, the innovation, let's say, within uh, the New Caledonian case when it comes to independence uh, referendums. There, has, there have been obviously also with disagreements, uh, further recognitions of the Kanak identity and also the creation of a so-called tribal senate, so of, a, of an extra <laughs> um, second chamber uh, that actually represents the um, Kanak population, which has altogether um, 28 recognized languages, but many more dialects again. And they actually also legislate when it, they have a say and they can veto when it comes to um, um, civil issues and cultural issues and so on uh, with regard to um, Kanak um, interests. Um, the autonomy in a nutshell um, basically uh, says that um, the uh, 
um, in essence, basically, the uh, the autonomy statute is constitutionally entrenched. It's uh, there's reference in the French constitution to it. Um, there is a special organic law uh, within the French uh, constitutional order that specifies the uh, list of competences. So it specifies uh, in concrete that France retrain, retains the competences in the fields of currency, defense, foreign affairs, justice, and public order. There are some competences where um, actually there is a shared um, responsibility. Um, the uh, Autonomy law also establishes a power sharing uh, system within Caledonia. And uh, obviously, uh, the, uh, the Kanak customary Senate I've just referred uh, to is also basically foreseen in this autonomy law. So you have a rather complex power sharing system in place, which is linked to the fact that there have been um, a series of independence referendums. What do these independence referendums say? What, what was the outcome of the independence referendums? So there has been one taking place in end of 2018. Uh, and the outcome well, was uh, much narrower than actually expected. Um, and uh, the other one uh, was done taking place in uh, October 2020. Again, uh, the no vote to independence has uh, won, but the outcome was actually also, again, narrower than expected. The question always remained the same. So um, do you want that New Caledonia um, gets um, full sovereignty and becomes independent. This is the question that has never been changed. What is important to note is obviously that there have been special electoral roles. And obviously why these referendums were also postponed for a long time is to create capacity on both sides and also to sort out the tricky questions with regard to who can vote in such referendums, how long do you have the like you know, what's about your residency in Caledonia? How how do you have to prove it and so on and so forth? Um, so in the end, there has been a um, the last uh, of the possible three referendum has uh, taken place uh, in December twenty. 21 and what you see from the slide here is actually that the no vote totally won and uh, the yes vote has very low percentage this is because the uh, third referendum was um, basically boycotted by the Kanak population um, so uh, it was boycotted because of COVID that hit finally also New Caledonia and because of the fact that uh, the Kanak population actually asked to postpone the referendum to uh, 2022, which was legally possible to do, uh, but uh, politically then uh, uh, Paris and the negotiating partners actually uh, decided to hold the referendum anyway in the end of 2021. And the issue that the Kanak leaders put forward is that uh, because of the Delta um, variant that hit uh, New Caledonia, many persons were not able to come to vote, many persons uh, had uh, many losses and so on and so forth. So they basically uh, announced to boycott uh, the referendum and they also did. So the big question, the elephant in the room, <laughs> is actually now how to square the circle. Um, so uh, to sum up, there has been an impressive conduct of the first two of the three independence referendums. So 2018 and 2020, 2020 actually, uh, there was uh, from both sides, uh, independentists and, uh, and uh, non-independentists, so loyalists, uh, uh, those who wanted to uh, remain uh, uh, with France, um, a, a fair conduct of the referendum itself, and also pretty like fair discussions on pros and cons. 
um, while the third referendum uh, uh, was uh, boycotted by the indigenous parties. Now the situation, the political situation is that both actually the parliament of New Caledonia and the government of New Caledonia are um, um, uh, the leaders basically um, are both headed by um, uh, pro-independence um, political leaders. And uh, you do have a uh, discourses and um, let's say unrest for the time being uh, between pro and anti-independent sides that are uh, totally along the lines where basically also uh, the uh, pro-independence leaders um, decided to uh, cut off uh, negotiations. And uh, uh, what on top of it comes to it is that all these political institutions of power sharing I mentioned, um, which are in very specific terms written down in the autonomy law of New Caledonia, they're basically expiring because they were linked to the um, independence referendum circle, to the three independence referendums, and they are now about to expire with basically uh, the Congress with the next uh, vote of the, uh, of the parliament of New Caledonia in early 2024. So the question that remains is uh, what to do, how to come along with it, uh, and how to reorganize uh, the political institutions, the functionings of the political institutions, how to keep the power sharing, how to deal with details with regard to electoral roles. And uh, next to it, obviously, there is again, uh, the fact that powers, that competences that have been transferred to New Caledonia cannot anymore uh, be uh, taken uh, back, legally speaking. So um, I uh, close uh, by saying that obviously the ability of referendums to sustain peace in the long run um, is only uh, possible if you do have a broad-based internal reconciliation. And um, although it's not so much, at least in European media, right, uh, the, the case, it's a, for the time being in these weeks, a very interesting case, because, uh, for example, just this weekend, actually, the uh, the major independence uh, party had hold a big congress to decide whether or not they will sit down on the negotiation table uh, uh, with, uh, with representatives from metropolitan France. So um, we're expecting, let's say, how the negotiations go on with regard to the future status of New Caledonia uh, and how the new autonomy law uh, will look like, including all the political institutions. Thank you. Thank you, Elizabeth. Thank you very much, uh, both of you, for these really fascinating cases. Uh, I learned a lot uh, already, and um, as I said, I'm already <clears throat> starting to uh, question some of the assumptions I had uh, for my really basic knowledge about these two cases that uh, I had before. And um, I mean, there really fascinating as i said especially in the context of this you now the process of decolonization and uh, this um, uh, you now debates and processes related to uh, external self-determination uh, i mean and could see so from these cases that this is not really a straightforward let's say uh, path they are uh, i mean it's a, it's a lot of space for creativity when it comes to how to to move forward in this process and what kind of solutions to achieve in the end um, and um, although in the case of new caledonia it seems that the independence the no no like clear independence is some is out of uh, out of the table nowadays uh, obviously there is uh, i think the discussions are now uh, concentrating in what you you mentioned this kind of uh, very special sovereignty and uh, this kind of relations between uh, uh, Paris and uh, New Caledonia. Um, um, I, let me check if there are questions. I think there are not yet questions in the chat. So therefore I would use 
uh, my powers, my exclusive powers, and I can uh, ask you my first questions. Uh, well, in fact, the question that uh, it's, it's partly valid for both of you because um, I, I took some notes and in both uh, presentations, um, one aspect that was uh, mentioned um, regards natural resources, that both these uh, autonomies, these island autonomies are very rich in natural resources. Um, and this, I think, brings uh, an additional or, or somehow a layer of complexity to, to, to the discussion about autonomy, uh, competencies, uh, you know, sharing uh, not only uh, powers, but also resources and, of course, independence you know, and control over this. Um, and the second related point, uh, I want to, to ask you, um, of course, it's a kind of um, connection to um, the geopolitical context that we all follow probably these days, um, as, especially since this, um, you know, the international law, international order uh, ups, is, what is being upset by, by this uh, you know, uh, blood and violation of, uh, of um, international legal system by, uh, by Russia. Uh, and also in this context of an increasing competition between let's say so, great powers. Because again, both cases, I think uh, they are at the crossroads of this kind of very strong interest when it comes to geopolitics. I mean, in the case of Greenland, uh, it made headline, headlines in a kind of you no know, uh, funny way, uh, a statement of uh, ex-president Trump uh, was proposing Denmark to buy Greenland. Uh, <laughs> I mean, obviously, uh, Besides this, um, let's say, ridiculous uh, proposal, there are some clear, uh, uh, obvious, uh, um, no strategic interest of, of uh, United States, uh, and nowadays probably also Europe, when it comes to uh, the Arctic, Arctic region and uh, the re renewed interest or activism of, of, of Russia in the Arctic as well. And then in the case of New Caledonia, I think this is obviously that, uh, I mean, uh, for France, but also then again, maybe for European Union and, uh, and uh, the Western, let's say, world as well, uh, New Caledonia can be considered kind of you no know, um, outpost there in the in the Pacific, and uh, especially in in this new climate of competition of more more and more assertive Chinese policies in the region. Uh, this, I think, can also uh, be uh, one of the, say, the main points to, to have in mind uh, when we discuss about autonomy, independence, and so on and so forth. So to sum up, my question is, if you can maybe give your, your like, no opinions about this combination of factors, you know, the natural resources, the geopolitical importance, and, uh, of course, the indigenous indigenous peoples uh, you know, uh, population, and then also the political actors. Uh, you mentioned, Maria, the, the um, you know, uh, parties, pro-independence, pro, pro uh, uh, like, no, remaining pro-autonomy, pro kind of. Uh, and I was wondering how these parties uh, uh, claiming to represent indigenous population and also indigenous population themselves uh, position uh, uh, themselves when it comes to the issue of you know, uh, the geopolitical importance, natural resources and the relations with uh, Denmark and, uh, and France. Thank you. I can, uh, I mean, who wants to, to start, uh, please free to, to take the floor. Well, maybe I can start. Uh, so uh, regarding the natural resources, so that was actually something that was on a little bit of a hype in 2012, 13, uh, when, uh, when there was a lot of interest from uh, foreign investors coming in uh, to, to Greenland. Uh, what has happened is that the, the raw materials, the world prices have, have, have uh, of course, decreased. And since then, the interests also have been kind of decreasing, uh, especially in the oil and, and gas industry, uh, and also because of the Arctic uh, uh, being fragile for, for uh, uh, exploitation of, of oil and, and gas. But there are still, of course, interests in, in the minerals. And, and there is a Greenlandic Mineral Act, which was actually uh, uh, coming into place uh, 
linked to the new Self-Government Act in 2009, and it was implemented in 2010. And uh, what Greenland has done is that they have taken some of the practices uh, from, uh, from Norway and looked also towards Canada, what they have been dealing with, especially since uh, Canada also has a lot of assets in indigenous uh, regions as well. Um, uh, so, so there are quite strict uh, regulations uh, for uh, 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 this kind of companies, the mineral uh, mining companies coming in, which has also a little bit uh, uh, done it a little bit more uh, uh, difficult for for the companies themselves uh, to actually begin uh, with with their projects. So uh, there are only, uh, I think, there are well maybe three operating uh, mining projects at the moment. One is a very small one, which is uh, 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 a ruby mine outside uh, uh, Nook, um, and then you have a, 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 a kind of a sand mine uh, outside Ganga Luzwak, uh, in up a little bit in the north of, of Nook. Uh, and then there is a, a sink mine, uh, which is also, uh, I think, have begun operating. But the, the, the big issue has been in the south, where, where you also have uranium uh, uh, in the same mountain as you have the rare earth elements. And that, that has been the, the, the kind of very political debated issue. Uh, what, how to handle that. And, and uh, there has been a, an agreement done between uh, Denmark and Greenland regarding the uranium uh, issue, but the political uh, the parties have had a little bit different opinions on what to, uh, how to, uh, to deal with this. And, uh, and now since IA is in, in, in the government position in Inuit Atakati, they have uh, said that uh, that it is a no go for uh, for exploiting uranium, while Simut has been a little bit more in favor for it. Uh, but then you, you you need to have a, a certain uh, uh, threshold for uh, for how much uranium that you should then uh, 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 exploit, so to speak. Uh, so, so there are quite a, a good, I would say, uh, uh, framework, uh, and and of course there are still interests for, coming from Australia, Canada, Norway, uh, and also China uh, regarding these uh, these kind of mining projects. And uh, it's usually uh, done in such a way that you have an uh, an exploration phase, uh, which is quite a long phase where where they have to do uh, a lot of uh, field work uh, and and uh, also this uh, social impact assessments and environmental impact assessments uh, in order to even start uh, to dig in the ground, so to speak. Uh, yeah, we see also an increase uh, geopolitical uh, increase uh, because of uh, of the interests coming, uh, as you said. Uh, my, it might ha have been seen as a, a little bit of a, a joke when when uh, Trump was <laughs> coming out with his statement about uh, buying Greenland. But there are uh, are things behind it, of course. And and the U.S. has actually reopened a consulate here in Nook, uh, and this is also seen as as a kind of a proactive movement from the U.S. side to have more direct. Uh, surveying and uh, control over what is happening in, in Greenland as such. And it's also to keep uh, China a little bit out uh, of the picture, in a sense, uh, 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 since the US is very uh, afraid of China uh, coming in uh, into the markets, especially in, in the mining sector. Uh, so we also see an interest from the EU. We had a recently a, a EU conference here in, in Nook, here in, in uh, uh, early fe February, and uh, there will be an EU office uh, established uh, in Nook. Uh, there is already an appointed uh, person for representative uh, coming from from the European Commission. 
from the, the Denmark who will work within this office. Of course, there will probably be also some locals hired for, for that office as has been done also for the US consulate. There are uh, local persons also hired uh, because of the language issues, uh, definitely. Uh, so what, what we see is of course that within the parliament, uh, I mean, uh, all, all, all the politicians uh, are uh, of course of, of Greenlandic heritage. So they are all indigenous in, in that sense. Uh, most of the debates are, are going on in, in Greenlandic, but there are also some politicians who, who are not able to speak Greenlandic um, and, and therefore there are also interpretations in, in place. So, so everything is usually translated uh, both in Greenlandic and, and Danish, but most of the debates uh, uh, are, are usually in, 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 in Greenlandic. Um, uh, so, uh, I mean, there are different, also a little bit different opinions on how to define a Greenlander and, and so on. There has been a little bit uh, some popularized, uh, more populist uh, people also uh, uh, from uh, the Nalarak uh, party saying that there should be a, a register for the elections, for instance, uh, uh, of who, who sh should be able to vote and stand as candidates and, and so forth. This is so, something that has been a little bit discussed, but not uh, not really uh, realized yet, at least. Uh, so, so there are these uh, different opinions uh, always going on, and and of course, ICC, the Inuit Circumpolar Council, also have a very strong voice uh, here in Greenland. Uh, so, uh, they are of course working for for all Inuit people uh, in, in, uh, in, in the Arctic. Uh, so, so yes, what has been problematic maybe is, is the, the, the postponement of the Arctic Council since uh, because of Russia's invasion of Ukraine. Uh, so uh, uh, the work within uh, the Arctic Council is in, uh, at a standstill at the moment and uh, and of course, for, for Greenlandic, uh, uh, from a Greenlandic point of view, this is a little bit problematic since this is a forum where, where Greenland actually uh, uh, it has a, a say. Uh, uh, also, uh, of course, within the Kingdom of Denmark, uh, Greenland and Faroe Islands have uh, have the same amount of, 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 of time for for speeches, but also the ICC as a, a permanent. Uh, uh, representative is also here in of course working uh, a lot with, with the other indigenous uh, organizations so so this has been a little bit of a, a problematic issue actually uh, since uh, since uh, uh, the work is now uh, at the sense that we will see what happens with Norway taking over uh, the the chairmanship if this will uh, if, if there will be some kind of solution uh, of how the Arctic Council work can, can go on. I th think I will stop there. <laughs> Thank you. Elizabeth? Uh, yeah, um, um, I think um, I'll start with uh, with the question of the natural resources. Obviously, I do not have time now to go into details, but the uh, the major takeaway is that the natural resources have always been part of any negotiations uh, revolving around uh, these agreements. I have cited, uh, cited. So basically, uh, the natural uh, resources and the revenues from the natural resources um, have always been also uh, a um, subject and uh, of contestation um just to say that in the 80s there has there has been uh, um civil unrest uh, which was also due to the fact that there has been an accident in one of the mines um so it has always been part of the political negotiations around peace uh, agreements around reconciliation attempts and so on and so forth um obviously it is also now a question 
now when basically the uh, power sharing agreements as enshrined in the uh, um, Numea agreement are expired, technically speaking, um, it is obviously also a, a question on how is basically the issue of nickel, but also hydrocarbons uh, dealt with in the future. Um, who will have a say on it with regard to the development, to the exploitation, how much, and so on and so forth. And how are you going to revise also all the arrangement when it comes to the distribution of the revenues, uh, fiscally issues linked to it, and so on. Um, and this is actually a tricky part because this links up a bit to your geopolitical argument, Sergio, you put in, uh, because China is obviously present in uh, in the Pacific as well, in the sense that they have um, demonstrated in various phases and they are actually um, also um, within the management of, of one of, uh, of the mines, let's say, uh, put simply. Uh, um, so uh, the issue is that uh, France, with the outcome of the three referendums that uh, clearly state, even though contested, the last one is contested, but the validity of the last one is contested because it was boycotted. But in the end, in essence, they clearly state that there is a no to independence. Um, so the argument that uh, metropolitan France obviously puts forward is also that the presence of France in the Pacific means also presence of the European Union of Europe in the Pacific. Um, uh, with in geopolitical terms, and that links it also up to uh, the position of Australia, which is the direct big neighbor. Obviously, Australia was very hesitant in reacting um, and officially commenting uh, the um, outcome or non participation, let's call it like this, in the third independence referendum. It was totally hesitant, actually. Then, obviously, it, it it, it took the stance of uh, recognizing, confirming that there have been three referendums as uh, foreseen in the uh, peace agreements and all the three were, have uh, have been halted and then actually the outcome of all the three has been no to independence. But it's a tricky issue, obviously. The, 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 the economic interests of um, China uh, privately speaking, so in uh, public-private partnerships when it comes uh, to issues within the mining sector. Um, the, uh, the presence of uh, Europe uh, via France in that part of the world in the Pacific and the relation then uh, to um, Australia. And on top of this, obviously, there is to say that the uh, the Kanak population is not a monolithic, uh, <laughs> um, yeah, population. So there are different interests also within the Kanak population, apart from the fact that there are many, many, three hundred different tribes within the Kanak population with different customary uh, laws and twenty eight recognized, uh, let's say, Kanak languages. There's also within the Kanak population, obviously, those who are uh, strongly in favor of um, being with, uh, continuing to have a kind of um, relationship that might go towards a confederation or whatever it is called, or those saying like, no, we really want to be independent. We will create your, our own capacity, but we don't want to be any more dependent, let's say financially also uh, um, from, uh, from, from France. Uh, um, so this is a uh, very tricky issues and um, uh, legally speaking, there might be one answer, but politically and uh, socially speaking, uh, the, there, is a, there is obviously also another um, aspect uh, to it. Um, yeah, and uh, last I can mention obviously that uh, there is, if you look into economic data, um, there has always been a, a huge inequality 
with regard to um, access of Kanaki population to uh, public jobs and uh, economic uh, distribution of wealth and so on and so forth. This is a, a, a big, big, big um, challenge in uh, New Caledonia. Yeah, thank you again both. Now there are some questions uh, in the um, uh, in the chat, in the Q&A section. Um, the first one is uh, rather general and I think applies to both cases. So I think it fits very well as a kind of conclusive question. Uh, I will keep it for the end. And now we'll move to the second one from uh, Tove Malloy. There's a question for Maria. and is um, uh, following what is the status of the constitution drafting and how do you see it develop? Yeah, thank you for the, the question. Well, the, there is a constitutional commission that has been established uh, several years ago and it has been a little bit back and forth with the work. Uh, there will uh, come out uh, uh, some kind of uh, statement uh, here in april so we are we are all waiting for what what it will contain because it, it has been very silent of uh, what what the, this uh, group is actually uh, uh, doing uh, and we also have colleagues at the university who are uh, uh, involved in this work and and they have uh, they cannot say anything so uh, so we are all waiting for to see what will uh, come out of, of this uh, uh, commission. Uh, uh, the thing, the idea has been, of course, to work uh, out a, a constitution for, for Greenland. Uh, that has been, been the main purpose of, of this constitutional commission. But there has been a little bit of, of different uh, participants, uh, uh, people who have been... Uh, 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 withdrawn and uh, new people coming in and so on uh, because of, uh, of also uh, uh, the appointed persons from the political parties and so on. Uh, so, uh, but yeah, we are we are still waiting for for the results. <laughs> uh, uh, what will come out of it? So, mm -hmm. so yeah, in April we might uh, uh, know more. Okay. Thank you. And now uh, <clears throat> I think uh, there's a question. Yeah, the third one is from Francisco Javier Romero. Uh, it comes to the, again to the topic of the security they mentioned, and uh, he asked, "What is the position of uh, on NATO of pro-independence parties?" I think this regards again probably Greenland more than uh, than New Caledonia. Yeah. So. <clears throat> Uh, most of uh, of uh, I would say the Greenlandic parties. Uh, well, there are some. Uh, there is some that actually have been uh, the Social Democrats ha have actually uh, had in their uh, program that they wanted to see uh, an own uh, uh, some sort of own military force uh, in 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 Greenland. But uh, I would say it's a, a, a little bit. <laughs> Unlikely, since uh, there is a too few people, uh, uh, and uh, what the, the Arctic Command, the Danish military, has done since that is the, the military which is in place here in 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 Greenland has done tried to to do these different campaigns uh, uh, to get more Greenlandic people into uh, into the uh, to the army um, and. Uh, so I would say that most people uh, are uh, uh, in favor of NATO uh, because uh, uh, this is the, the security alliance that people trust since we also have the, the two layer base uh, up in the north. Uh, and uh, so, so I would say that th this is a kind of a natural uh, linkage uh, for, for the security dimension. All right, thank you. Um, and now uh, the first question, I'll come back to the first question, is um, uh, from uh, Shak Nawaz Gul Nengro. And uh, he asks uh, whether, given the challenging situation, like integration tendencies of central governments, do you see any danger to the longevity or sustenance, sustenance of, of autonomies? 
Uh, and somehow I can add uh, a question from a colleague that is linked with this one. In general, for both of you, um, well, looking back to this, uh, you no, know, the processes, the dynamics that uh, uh, we discussed so far in these two cases, um, what kind of lessons do you think that other uh, indigenous uh, communities uh, seeking greater autonomy of self-determination or other island autonomies can learn from these two cases if there is something that uh, uh, somehow uh, can be take, taken over and uh, reflected upon and for, the, for other, other contexts, uh, more or less uh, with a similar, let's say, um, features. Who wants to go first? I can start. Uh, okay. <laughs> so, um, um, I mean, the lesson to be learned, obviously, from New Caledonia is that it has been and still is, actually, if you look into the details, a very innovative um, process of uh, proceduralizing um, negotiations uh, by linking up uh, and uh, bringing in, obviously, also uh, the the electorates in a, a truly unique um, system of um, referendums, because it was not just one, it was a series of referendums. So this is, uh, technically speaking, uh, really innovative um, uh, proceduralization of, um, let's say, uh, a potential conflict that could have been much more um, um, difficult, let's say. This is the major uh, lesson, technically speaking. Then obviously, if you look where uh, where we are right now in this month and uh, this year and, uh, and up to April 2024, there's a lot of negotiations going on because everything what is uh, actually... Um, now in place is put into question so what is the challenge here the challenge here is to basically define or try to define or interpret or find a way to interpret how a, a new caledonian citizenship could look like that actually includes all uh, parties and there are uh, many that actually is appealing to to all the persons living there and to persons moving there and moving away. Um, so this is uh, basically the big uh, question um, right now. And uh, so are the relevance of autonomies in generally um, to come to the question um, is, is high because it actually is a, a, a toolkit, a, uh, a means um, where you make um, conflicting parties sitting together and you decide on how to actually uh, move forward. So I would not say that uh, autonomy as a tool, as a mechanism, as a dynamic um, uh, is actually uh, not anymore on work. It should be much more in fashion, to put it very simple, because of uh, the many layers of crises we have. Yeah, well, uh, as I see it, well, Greenland has now been over 300 years uh, underneath uh, the Danish kingdom. And, and actually, uh, uh, there was uh, in 2021, when there should have been that 300 years ju jubilee, uh, there was no jubilee because <laughs> no one wanted to, to, uh, uh, to have this celebration here in, in, in Greenland, especially here in Nuuk. Uh, 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 the mayor was saying we are not going to celebrate anything uh, 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 at this occasion. So, so there is a kind of a, a stand uh, from the Greenlandic side as well to, uh, of course, develop uh, the autonomy. Uh, and this is what uh, what all political parties are trying to do, and also. Uh, uh, the government and and so on. So th there are more and more matters uh, transferred, and and they do it step by step, and it has been a peaceful process. Of course, not as in New Caledonia, where you had a, a lot of civil wars and 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 conflicts, 
uh, here it has been a, a peaceful process uh, in more of a democratic manner. So I think that uh, the, the negotiations will still go on uh, between uh, Copenhagen and NUC uh, and uh, uh, the future will, will We'll see, we will see what happens in the future. Uh, independence is, is the, the main goal uh, for, for Greenland, that's for sure. Okay, so um, I, I see that there is one more question. So with your permission, I would uh, like to also uh, address this one. It's coming from Lilia Lieva. Mm, she's thank you for the excellent presentation. I would like to know both of the presenters' perspectives on participation of indigenous communities from Greenland, the New Caledonia, and global governance institutions. For example, in the UN Forum on Indigenous Issues, are there any trends of what they are promoting or new recommendations for indigenous people's rights? Well, maybe I can start. So uh, since I have a, <laughs> a close colleague and my PhD student, Sara Olsig, who is uh, now sharing the International uh, Inuit Circumpolar Council, uh, they are working on, on a little bit different issues and projects. Uh, and also, of course, on the UN level uh, with the, the Forum for Indigenous Peoples. Uh, some issues, uh, are of course to improve the participation of indigenous peoples, uh, especially in education and research, uh, and also uh, this kind of ethical guidelines uh, have been coming out recently uh, uh, for how to protect uh, the indigenous peoples, uh, for instance, from uh, foreign researchers and, and so on, people who are just coming in, uh, flying in and flying out, uh, as we call them. So, so there are uh, work still going on, of course. The language issue is another thing uh, to protect uh, the indigenous language. Uh, and of course, the climate change issue, uh, since this will uh, affect a lot of indigenous peoples uh, around the world. On the part of New Caledonia, right now, obviously, uh, the um... The leaders of uh, the major uh, party, the Kanakan Socialist uh, National Liberal Front, um, basically files obviously um, all kind of um, letters and so on to the UN uh, with regard to their stance that they say that the third referendum should not be valid because of the circumstances. So uh, this was filed. Um, and uh, more generally speaking, um, there is uh, also uh, a uh, general participation and representation of uh, the Kanak population uh, within the region of the Pacific when it comes to supranational organizations, because there are different ones that actually represent the so-called group of uh, Melanesia, which is a, a basically a, one of uh, the indigenous uh, peoples that actually comprises many, many peoples from uh, that part of the world with the many islands that are there. So, um, and uh, it is um, topic-wise, issue-based. Um, obviously, there is the same work also from uh, organizations organ international organizations or bigger NGOs linked to uh, international organizations with regard to um, um, social economic inequalities, um, access, uh, and so on and so forth, capacity building and all this obviously is also going on and uh, well received by the indigenous peoples in New Caledonia and um, and obviously also they, they call for it and they look for corporations on that, yeah. Yes, thank you very much, both of you. And I think this is a good point to, to end with. Uh, <clears throat> because I mean, um, if you think about UN and um, indigenous peoples, I think uh, it's interesting to also follow uh, the developments in other countries when it comes to uh, land rights or the protection of the traditional way of life 
of indigenous peoples. Um, uh, for example, in Northern countries, usually we have this you no know, stereotype, this image of you know, Sweden, Finland, Norway as being in a kind of you no know, front runners of uh, when it comes to human rights and the uh, protection of uh, minority rights of rights of indigenous peoples. But in, in very recent times, um, uh, we see more and more in the news, this you no know, conflicts between uh, Sami people, uh, Sami uh, you now representatives of the Sami community, uh, challenging policies of, of these governments when it comes to exploitation of uh, resources. Um, yeah, a few days ago, or last, even yesterday, in the news, there were these you know, um, uh, headlines about uh, activists, Sami activists uh, um, occupying uh, Ministry of uh, uh, Resources in, in, in Norway. Um, I've seen recently the, the news in Finland that uh, the government, uh, third, for the third government in a row, postponed any um, no uh, legal developments regarding the issue of uh, of Sami of Sami concerns. Uh, for example, uh, the question of who is uh, able to vote and to stand as a candidate. No, this is absolutely an essential question. No, so who is going to vote? Who before deciding on something, you have to decide who is going to vote on that thing. So uh, obviously, uh, and the climate change that affects, I think, uh, to really a uh, large extent, uh, such you know, uh, areas of, uh, of uh, indigenous people's populations and also uh, has a um, uh, really uh, uh, powerful impact on the traditional way of life that definitely is something that the UN uh, can also, I mean, is already, the issue is already raised there, but uh, uh, definitely will see developments uh, over there regarding these issues as well. Um, I think we uh, we should uh, unfortunately stop here. We went a bit over the the timeline we foreseen, but I think it was better to to uh, spend a bit more time. Uh, although probably would have needed uh, probably two, three, four more such webinars to really uh, uh, go more into to something, some of these very very interesting and fascinating aspects of these autonomy cases. Um, I would like to thank, first of all, to the two speakers uh, for your very interesting presentations and uh, for your um, uh, insights regarding uh, the, the cases. Uh, I would like to also mention the fact that the Greenland case study is already published uh, on the website of the um, Autonomy Arrangements in the World project. Uh, Maria uh, did an update of the case studies that uh, was published very recently and that the new the case study in New Caledonia will be published uh, this year. Uh, Elizabeth is working uh, on on the draft paper with another colleague, so we will have um, <clears throat> also New Caledonia as a case study uh, published soon on the website. Uh, I will invite you, of course. Um, to, to uh, check the website itself, to also follow the Facebook page of the project. Uh, and uh, um, saying this, I would also like to, to thank you, to thank to my colleague Jakob Volger, who uh, helped uh, uh, also with the managing the questions and uh, to my colleague Ivan, who uh, ensured that everything went smoothly from the point of view of the technical support. And uh, last but not least, I would like to uh, thank to the audience uh, for their uh, participation, for their patience, for their interest in, in this topic. And um, I'm looking forward to uh, the next webinar. This is an annual webinar series. So next year, uh, probably more or less in the same period, um, uh, we'll have another uh, webinar, uh, usually again, selecting two case studies. Uh, however, um, we will usually be quite active also during the year. So um, uh, if you follow us in this uh, now social uh, social media, the two institutes or the autonomy around the world uh, uh, Facebook page, for example, you will be able to uh, also receive information uh, information regarding um, activities that we organize uh, that are definitely um, going to tackle some of the issues that are relevant for. Uh, minorities, indigenous peoples, and autonomy arrangements. So uh, once again, thank you everybody and wish you, wish you a good evening or good day in case uh, it's still day where you are. All the best. Bye-bye.